And on this week's podcast, we have Latin cessation, or Latina sensation, I should say, Laura. Bien. Yeah, kid. Welcome, welcome, everybody, back to another episode of the Handsome Home Buyer Podcast. My name is Charles, aka the Handsome Home Buyer, aka Captain Permit. Oh, you definitely have to get this one, <laughs> aka El Judío Maravilloso. <laughs> I don't have to say it. Yes! Hey, <laughs> so bro, bad. she she put you uh she put you oh. to uh to shame, bro. I, I would hope so. <laughs> so today's guest is a performer, a mortgage person, a realtor in nine months turned six figure agent. But before we go there, do you know who else is also a performer? Who can dance the salsa, the cumbia romantica, the bachata, the merengue, the what am I missing? I think I got them all right. <laughs> You know who? Captain Permit. 516-513-883. If you need plans, you need permits, you need anything permit related, tip to tip, Elmont to Montauk. We got you. Do you use Captain Permit? Uh, not yet. I will. <laughs> we got you. When the time comes, I will be calling Captain Permit. Thank you. 516-513-8838. Obviously, I'm the handsome home buyer. If you have a house that smells like cat pee, is dated from the 1960s, six inches of mold on the wall, human waste floating past the basin step, land, commercial property. I don't care. I'm quick. I'm easy. I'm a good time. I'm all cash. I will always relist the property. I want to buy it. 516-777. Sold. Okay. So, I am going to... Tr- we don't really know each other. No. But I've heard great things. I, uh, I always like the, the younger generation because my kind of contemporaries that are in the 35 to 45 year block are, I, they're slowing down. Like they're all saying to me, you know, I'm cool. I want to maintain, I want to coast. I'm happy doing flipping X amount of houses or selling X amount of houses or doing X mm-hmm. amount of loans, whatever it is. But the younger generation, you guys are like full of fire, ready to go. We're hungry. Just, just want to take over on the cutting edge of like technology and social media and everything that's going on. So I love to be around that because it keeps me young, it keeps me fresh, and it keeps you know new, unique ideas coming in. So we don't really know each other, but I've, again, I've heard great things. We were talking just before, and in your first nine months as a realtor, mm-hmm. you became a six-figure realtor, which I don't know if you know this, but that puts you in the top 1% of agents. Did you know that? No, I didn't. So I was toying with the brokerage model a while back. Mm-hmm. So there's this uh, thing called broker metrics mm-hmm. where you can see what all the agents are doing. So 28,000 realtors on Long Island. Mm-hmm. Half of them have never done a deal. Two and a half percent of them gross commissions are $80,000 or more. Wow. So that puts you in like the top one and a half one percent of all agents. That's exciting. Mazel there's tov. There's my award. <laughs> Mazel tov. I'm going to try to get the name. Okay. I feel confident. Mm-hmm. You got this. Laura, mm-hmm. Andrea, mm-hmm. Guillen, mm-hmm. Patino. Yes, there you go. What, <laughs> what country do you think my accent is most is closest to? Wait, say like a phrase like "Hola, cómo estás." Like "Oye, oye, oye. tigre, qué lo que hay?" Oh, dr. There you go. All right. <laughs> As everybody knows, I am convinced that I was Spanish in a previous life. I think it's Dominican, but we'll uh, we'll see how it flushes out on the podcast. So, I want to get a little bit of backstory. Mm-hmm. You are very young. 24. Mm-hmm. Levy, you're still very young at 30. Thank you. Don't want Don't anybody to tell you any different. I'm kind of curious to know your background. You were not born here, correct? Yes, I was. You were? I am. You have the, and like, you have a pretty fierce accent for right. someone that was born I'm here. First generation American. First generation American. My parents weren't born here. Parents were born. My mother was born in Colombia. Okay. My father was born in El Salvador. Okay. Mm-hmm. Where'd you grow up? In here in Long Island, in Almont. Oh, okay. Mm hmm. The sixth borough. <laughs> it is. It is. The, it is the sixth borough. Elmont is like my um, one of my unicorns. I have a couple of unicorn towns where like I try to flip a house, but for mm-hmm. some reason it never happens. Somebody comes in at like the last minute and completely blows me out. Franklin Square is one of them. Mm-hmm. Elmont is another one. What else? Valley Stream. No, I've done Valley Stream. That's pretty much it. So grew up in Elmont, mm-hmm. first generation, dances, speaks Spanish, mm-hmm. which is huge. Yes. Because. I'm very thankful for it. I'm telling everybody, I'm like, Rosetta Stone, whatever it is, I watch telenovelas, which mm-hmm. helped me, but such a massive opportunity that I feel like very, very few people are capitalizing on. Mm-hmm. And in the Spanish community, I would argue that like word of mouth referrals spreads like, I've never seen anything. Once you get one Spanish person to trust you. That's it. Everybody, their like whole sphere of influence trusts you, period. So I know that um, we were talking before, 
had a bunch of different jobs before you got into this. Mortgages, you did pageants, you bartended. I did makeup and hair. So give me kind of like a little, like the abridged version of just where you came from growing up and how you got to kind of where we are now. So I was born and raised here in Long Island. I'm um, originally from Almont, mm -hmm. uh, first generation American. We grew up pretty poor. Uh, my, you know, my family didn't have a lot, but my mom never raised us to think that we were poor. Like mm. I look back now, and I'm like, oh shit, we were very, very poor. But my mom, like, I never needed or wanted anything. Like anything I wanted, my mom had for me. So I didn't grow up with that mindset of scarcity, okay. which I think helped. That's very interesting. A lot today, yeah. Because I would argue, and people like I post this on social media, and then people curse at me, and they're like, you're a mm -hmm. dick because you don't know what it's like. But I, I would argue that growing up, kind of, you know, less privileged mm -hmm. is. Is like is a blessing. Is an advantage. Without a doubt. Without a doubt, yeah. Um, I don't I don't know what it is to have, you know, the big house and that stuff. So to me it's exciting. It's to to, to get mm. there. I don't think like, oh, my parents didn't have it, so I can't, no. Okay. Um where we started off to where my mom got us to, um, was a big difference. Like at one point we were literally homeless. And I look back and I'm like, Oh shit, we we're homeless. My brother reminds me, he's like, You know we were homeless at one point. I'm like yeah, we were, but I didn't feel like that because mm. my mom had us set up properly like with her sisters and everything. So she never, she never made us feel poor. And then at one point, um, to when I when I was 10 years old, we got a house. Wow. So, you know, it was just the, the stepping stones of getting there. So that's how I look at life now. Like, it's a journey. My mom always said everything comes in your time. Like, when it's mm. your time to have it, it'll come. Just so be patient. Yeah, see, I think more importantly than, like, the material things of what you have is, like, are you lucky enough to be born with a kick-ass mother or father or preferably mm -hmm. both. That's really like, that's the winning lottery ticket yes. essentially. Yes, yes. So, grew up poor, whatever. We we bought our house when I was 10 years old. I had my own room finally in a pool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then uh, I guess I started like, you know, working when I was 14. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted everything. Mom's like, I'm tired of giving you stuff. Like, go go work. Go out and earn it. <laughs> yeah, go work. So that's when I learned how hard it was to make $1. So I was like, oh, okay. So, but I got serious about it. Started working. Um, I was working at my stepfather's hotel as a banquet server. Okay. Um, retail, selling shoes too. And then all up until uh, senior year, I just was like over school completely. Mm -hmm. And um, I had started dancing at that point already. I had done a pageant already. So I was like seeing the world more than it was just education. You know, there's a lot of other things to do out there. There's a lot mm. of other things to do besides have an education and make money from that. Okay. So um, the pageant or uh, dancing introduced me into pageantry. Okay. Because um, my dance teacher was the one who said, you're going to go into this pageant, um, Miss Hispanidad NYC, to represent okay. our group. Explain to me, I don't know a lot about the pageant world, the pageant circle, but it's it's huge. Yes. Like it is a big deal across the world. Yeah. Explain to me kind of like how that works. Like, uh, in what capacity? <laughs> um, just in general, like what's what's the prestige of it? Um, you know, how is it structured? There are regions. Is it like a national thing? Does it all feed into like something bigger, like a Miss America type of thing? Yeah. So there are plenty of different types of pageants okay. in New York alone. All I know is that Justin Timberlake, who is the man, was a pageant guy. He was he? I didn't know that. Justin Timberlake, per, he competed in pageants in Tennessee yeah. against women. He was the only guy, and he took that shit home. I love him. Do you? Yeah, I do. He's a man. I love JT. Okay, so um, there's so many different, um, I don't even know what to call it, like organizations in New York alone. There's okay. so many diff different organizations, and yes, they all start somewhere, and then you like work your way to something. Uh, you know, you win, you go up into the next rank, like okay. that. Uh, I, in my opinion, I don't know too many about the other ones, the first ones that I competed in, like it's not a career because like Miss America and Miss Universe, okay. it, like Miss USA and Miss Universe, it is, they have like money, they get salary, mm -hmm. so it is actually a career. Okay. Um, the ones that I've competed, it's not, so it's just like pretty much it's just to open doors. Okay. If you use it wisely, it's gonna open doors for you. No shit. So, um, but I, so I did four. Okay. I did four um, and I ended up just getting out of it because I'm like, this is not, the world I want to be in, like the getting dressed up. I love that stuff, but like to do it and then also to like, that's all I was just on the outside. She's yeah. a pretty girl, she's a pageant queen, that's it. And then I would talk to people about business and all that stuff. They'd be like, yeah, we don't want to hear it. I'm like, okay, it just was, it wasn't fulfilling enough for me. Okay. 
especially in the last one I did. I was like, the last one I was so excited. I'm like, oh, I got to, it felt like I could be inspirational to girls. Like, you know, you can do the beautiful stuff and also be very smart. Cause that's how my mom raised me. Like you have to have brains. Mm-hmm. Like you can't just be beautiful. Like your looks are not gonna get you where you wanna go. So um, I tried doing that in the last one and no one really cared. <laughs> the passion world, they do not care to like, just be quiet, model. And it's unfortunate because they take advantage of you too. Like they'll tell you like, come model for this and they'll try to get you to do things for free. Like yeah. you're working, and I would tell these girls that I was competing with, like, um, you gotta set your price. Like, you gotta take this serious. It's your business. Mm-hmm. Like, you are your product. So ultimately, it just turned me off completely. So that's why I can't say too much as to where it's gonna go, where it's gonna take you, unless you want to be an actress, unless you want to be on TV, you, you know, be, be a reporter or something of that aspect. Your so. mother must be a very tough lady, and I mean that <laughs> in like in the best possible, like most complimented mm-hmm. type of way. Because just it just seems like she. It's always interesting for me to see, like the hard wiring of how people developed and like where they came from. Mm-hmm. And just from like you talking about your mother, it's interesting to see that, you know, what kind of person she must be. Yeah, she's awesome. Tough love. I'm all about tough love. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I'm all about tough love. If you're if you like you if you're sensitive, don't be around me because I'll tell you something how it is, but with love. <laughs> Okay, the delivery is good. The delivery is <laughs> the intention is, is great, but so talk to me about bartending and bartending experience because like we talking before, like I have this theory that um, now later on at you know thirty, thirty five, forty, even older, buddies of mine that were bartenders are super, super, super successful people, mm-hmm. and I have this theory that bartenders just make the best business people. Yes, so um, I got the idea to get into bartending or nightlife because that's how I got into it was um, I was 17, my brother's a bartender, my brother's an excellent bartender. Mm -hmm. He told me, he's like, Laura, when you turn 18, go to a club and be a bottle waitress. So my older brother, I'm 17, my older brother's telling me this, I'm like, you want me to go bottle waitress? Like they they, (laughs) they dress half naked, I was saying all these things. I'm like, but they can make a lot of money. He, that's what he said. They make a lot, a lot of money. Of money. Lot He's of money. like, they make a lot of money. He's like, you would be stupid to not take advantage of that and do it. So I did. I had a friend that was a promoter, mm-hmm. and I just, I, you know, I connected with him again, and I said, can you get me a job? At eight, like the, literally the day I turned, I turned 18 December 27th. So like okay. that, I worked like the holiday, I think, like that New Year's Eve or something. I worked at night for the mm-hmm. first time. Um, then from there, I like very quickly, I started seeing who could teach me how to bartend. So I ended up getting a job at this restaurant in Astoria, and there was an excellent bar- uh, bartender behind the mm. bar. And I asked him, his name was Marco. I'm like, Marco, like, if I work here, this is the advice my brother gave me. So, okay. uh, he, Why didn't your bartender, uh, your brother just teach you how to bartend? Because um, he, he worked at different places. Like he okay. told me spe- specifically to go into nightlife. Like okay. that's where the money's at. Okay. So I was working from like 8.30 at night and getting home at six in the morning. I want you to know that bartending is my only like FOMO thing. I'm not gonna say- You can re- still get back into it. I mean, well, start it. <laughs> I never, the only thing I ever wanted to do just cause it looked like fun was bartend and it just it's never, it never happened. Plus I don't drink at all. So I oh, figured no? I'm like, I would crush it. Yeah, never never drank, never been drunk, nothing. No, you don't, nope. want, you don't take the sip? No, no? Okay. no, it tastes terrible. You haven't tried the right stuff. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> says that, but you can mask it with as much sugary <laughs> sweetness as possible. Like, okay. If booze did not have an impact on you, mm-hmm. would you drink it? Yes, I like craft from a, cocktails. From a young age? No. Okay. No, because like when you're young, you don't know. You just know you drink to get drunk or like to have fun and party. But exactly being a bartender now and um, okay. having my brother, I like craft cocktails. Like, don't give me, you know, a mixed drink like cranberry and vodka. So, what do you like? Bourbon. What? No. What did oh, you go? Oh, it's craft cocktails. Oh, craft. What is a craft cocktail? Craft cocktail is like, um, so specific places make them. That's okay. how you know it's a good bartender behind the bar. Okay. They can make pretty much anything. Uh, craft cocktails go from like, you know, like original old fashions, margaritas, and you know, okay. the way I would make a margarita in nightlife is not how I would make a margarita behind a craft cocktail bar. Okay. It's two different ways of making it. So it's it goes more into depth with that. Um, there's other drinks like daiquiris, you know, daiquiris are very, popularized in like nightlife or like party okay. life, the frozen daiquiris, all that stuff. Like, you know, daiquiris come with their backs. Every drink has a backstory. They, they, they're they made differently. They're made um, more authentically. You're like so, a connoisseur of booze. Uh, you're not just like. <laughs> my brother is, so that's where I've got it from. You're not just like pouring shots at a Hofstra bar. No, no, you no, no. like. Yeah, I you always the, bounce back and forth between the two. I'm so, so what made you ultimately leave bartending and then go into the real estate world? Cause you could really crush it 
as so, a bartender. So I was bartending from 18. Um, that's when I first started learning. I worked for free for two weeks learning mm. how to bartend. Okay. And then he gave me the opportunity to start actually working behind the bar. Okay. Um, so I did that. Um, I try, I, During that time I went to college twice. <laughs> yes, I remember we started going to yeah. you. you you beat you beat everything to death meaning <laughs> you'll try it you'll be like this isn't for me then you're like you know what i just want to make sure that i really gave it a shot yeah. go back a second time and then you're like all right now 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 i'm done yeah so the first time around um i went to college i, I right after high school i took a semester off worked okay. um to pay for my own way in college and i went to go study communications media because wow. i got taking from the pageant world okay that's what i wanted to do i wanted to be on the news you know be on you know be a reporter on e-news or okay. telemundo or something you know so <laughs> <laughs> i wanted to that's what i wanted to do i wanted to be a broadcasting journalist okay um within like that first two semesters i was like is that really the life i want like i thought about long term i'm like is that who i want to be is that the life i want to live and wake up to do every day i was like no absolutely not that's not for me what do you think about college in general um if you want to do something that requires a degree like that's your burning passion like you want to be a doctor a lawyer whatever the case is that's your burning passion you know you want to do that go for it like if you can see yourself in 10, 20 years waking up to be whatever profession that is and mm -hmm. you're so happy and that gets you going, do it. And if your career does not need a degree, don't go. <laughs> no, would you tell that to your kids? Yes. Yeah, no. I, like, like I have my, I have a little cousin. She's, her and I are very similar in many ways and very different other ways. The one way that we're very different and I always support her in this difference is that she likes school. She loves going to school. Okay. And she, she's like me, she's money hungry. I'm like, you kind of need to have a balance. Like you can't be all one or the other. Like you have, for you yourself, you have to have a balance. Like, and I always tell her like, stay in school, stay in school. She's like, I don't, I don't know what I want to be, but I know I want to be something in law. I'm like, all right, okay. so just stick to it. Like keep, keep moving along, keep putting the foot right, you know, one foot in front of the other. So that's what she said. She tells me like, I don't know, I want to be a businesswoman or I want to do this. I'm like, then get out of school. Like go experience life, go, yeah. you know, go live life. It's really hard though, man. Like I, um, I've been in real estate, this will be the end of my sixth year, mm -hmm. right? I didn't know I wanted to do that until I was in my early 30s. Mm -hmm. So they expect people to know at 17, 16, yeah, 18, 20, what you're supposed to do with the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And so many people are racking up like crazy debt. Because yeah. you paid your own way, right? Yeah, I went to Nassau. So Nassau is like I love dirt Nassau. cheap. I love my Nassau. Brother, Nassau I mean, is my favorite It is college. the best. I, awesome. You would think I'd get paid to promote it. I took golf and bowling. <laughs> did, you, you didn't, oh, you didn't. did you take a... Did you have to take like a gym when you went to college? Nassau requires it. Did you have it's, to take a gym? I had, honey, I dropped out. What did you twice? Yeah, but you were you were there for like a period of time. So my so I have two older brothers. The okay. oldest one who gives me all my life advice. Okay. Um, <laughs> this is the bartender. <laughs> yes. Got it. So he told me. How many? There's three. You guys have, all together. Yes. Got it. Mm -hmm, and you're the youngest. I'm um, the, the youngest. only girl. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um. So. When I was in high school, he said, listen, Laura, I, in high school, I was very studious. Like I had good grades. I was always in advanced classes. Um, I went to Swanica High School, which is kind of different. It's seven mm -hmm. through 12, all mixed up. There's no division between middle and high school. Okay. So I was technically yeah, in high school since seventh grade. Interesting. Just because how the way it's set up. And okay. then I, on top of that, I was taking advanced classes. I was always, you know, whatever AP, whatever it's called. <laughs> so um, he told me, he's like, listen, go to Nassau. Like nobody, your first two years anywhere is the same. Go to Nassau, save money. How old is he? He's 32. Okay. He's like, go to Nassau, save your money. Um, he was saying all these things to try He's to He's a sharp me. guy. Yeah, he is. And at like a, a young age. Mm -hmm. So he was saying all these things to try to convince me. And then I think the two winning points that he gave me that like was like, all right, I'm going. He offered to pay, which he didn't. <laughs> For college? Yeah, he didn't, but it's okay. Um, He's like, if you go to, if you go, because you he, weren't going to go to school. No, no, I wasn't going to go to Nassau. I was okay. like, at that time when I was, I was, I don't know, 15 years old. I was like, I'm going to go to, um, I don't even know what college I want to go to, but I wanted to be a psychologist originally. I'm like, I'm going to go to this school, that school, like university. So he's like, no, go to Nassau. So he was trying to bribe me into Nassau. Okay. So he's like, if you go to Nassau, I'll pay for your first two years. I was like, all right. And then Bet. the second point was, he's like, if you go to Nassau, you don't got to take your SATs. I was like. Okay, because <laughs> uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, you don't have to take your SATs. You I just go that. in. And, you go in and you take like a test, like literally like um, reading, math. Okay. You know, yeah, you take a basic like entry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you I remember that. You take that instead. I remember that. So and then it's the same thing. He's like it, it equates to the same thing. Nassau was fucking awesome. Yes, it was. For so the I went short time that I was there. I went to Farmingdale, Nassau, and Hofstra. Like I kind of made the rounds. Mm -hmm. 
when I graduated high school, I'm like, I don't want to grow up. My mom's like, you have to go to college. So I went to farm. I was like, this place is terrible. And then I realized I'm like, fuck, I might as well get some good grades because maybe one day I'll have to grow up. And that's when I went to Nassau and Nassau was my favorite. Yeah. Man. At that point in time, and I'm really dating myself now, you got a two-year degree for five grand. And I learned more at NASA than I learned anywhere else. That's what my brother was telling me. Um, you know, he's trying to get me to go to that school. And then he also told me, he's like, listen, like, I know you have your dreams and everything. I'm not going to shut, shut your dreams down. But he's like, you're going to go to school and you're going to meet people. You're going to live life. You're going to work different things. You're going to find out about different professions and careers that you didn't even know existed. He's like... Don't st- don't marry yourself to to a career yet. Like go live life. Like if you want to be a psychologist, take the classes or whatever. Okay. But like explore, get to know things. How did he know all of this? Because he was still really young at the time. So you're 15 essentially at that. He's what eight years older than you. Yeah. So he was 23. Mm-hmm. At 23, like yeah. How did he know? Damn. I didn't know. I didn't know. I feel like I didn't know <laughs> shit until I was 30. So it's interesting. Maybe from our older cousin Mauricio, who's he's like in his he's a retired he's retired in in Europe he's like only like in his mid 40s I think sidebar if I ever have a kid it's gonna be a hardcore like I want my kid's name to be, like I really like Alejandro like, that's, that's my brother's middle name my brothers have very we all have Spanish names it's, the oldest is Felipe okay and the middle one's Marcos Alejandro Alejandro mm-hmm. yeah or Cruz Cruz is a last name honey oh, Cruz can be a first name that's like very modern. Did I just stump you on a Latin on a, that's a, on last a Latin name. culture question Cruz it could be both I mean, that's modern. People are naming their kids whatever they want these days. It's very modern. I'm but look, I don't think that's like a name. I looked through a book of like Spanish names and one of them was Cruz. Okay, it's a book, but do you know anybody named Cruz? Their Shh. first name Cruz? I don't know anybody with the last name named Guillen, but you said there's a ton of people that are Salvador. that's a last name, honey. Shh. A oh first boy. name. <laughs> I feel, uh, all right. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna back down now for safety's sake. <laughs> Continue. Where are we picking up from? <laughs> so, anyway, Mauricio. my brother, <laughs> Mauricio. Mauricio. Yeah, I think that's why my brother, who knows, maybe, Mauricio uh, did very well and is doing very well for himself in life uh, with school and everything. So I think that's where Mar- Felipe, excuse me, got his advice from. Maybe my mom, too. But, um, so anyways, I went to college for psychology. I hated, I think what turned me off from college was Nassau County's parking lot. <laughs> Nassau uh, Community College parking lot. Yeah, in the, what is that, the, the cluster, the yes. ABC? Fucking nightmare. Yeah, I think I that's what that. turned me off. I was like, oh, I can't do this. can't put myself through this today. Well, you were working full time to pay to put yourself through also, yeah, which I is was, a totally different experience. I would literally go to work from 8.30 at night, 6 in the morning, okay. go home, take a shower, like drink coffee and go to school. Shit. And I went to school full time. What were you, where were you working at that time? In the boroughs. Okay. No, you said you were working from 8 to 6, right? Like a regular 9 to 5 S No, honey, 8.30 at night to 6 in the morning. Oh, yeah. Jesus. And then go to school? <laughs> yeah. Who does that? Me. Hello. Wow. <laughs> you obviously don't need a lot of sleep. Uh, now I do. I, this, thank in your, God in real estate. In your older age, yeah. you need more sleep. Yeah. Now I, well, I'm just very happy to have it back. But yeah. Jesus. I was running a lot of coffee. Wow. Good for you. Thank you. But yes, yeah, so I would go to school full time. Okay. Um, and then you finally, you were just like, this ain't for me. Parking sucks. So yeah, with psychology. So I started, I went back to, you know, I just went back to doing full-time bartending um, with nightlife. And then I would have like a daytime job too. Like at an office, I worked at dealerships, um, different things like that to get my feet wet to try to figure out what I wanted to do. Mm. Um, in 2000, I don't even know what year, when I was 19 years old, I think, 19, 20 years old, I decided to get into real estate. So that was the first time I like entertained real estate. What brought you into real estate? I have no idea. I don't remember. You just like I think it was from maybe a YouTube video. Like I always okay. watch like YouTube videos. But back then I don't well, I didn't know about podcasts back then, so I would watch inspirational YouTube videos, people like what you do now. Mm-hmm. But when I was nineteen talking about whatever they did. So I think I heard somebody talk about real estate and how they make all this money in real estate and all this stuff. So I started watching more and more videos on it and I was like, Oh shit, I wanna do this. So I got into it at 19. I went to work in the city. Okay. Um, doing rentals. Um, didn't love it. As an agent? Yeah. Okay. I didn't love it. Um, and then, so basically that just was a point in my life where something very traumatic happened. I had like a loss mm-hmm. of a couple of friends that I witnessed. So that's like wow. shut me, yeah, it shut me down completely. Um, so I had PTSD. Like in front of you? Yeah, it was a, there was a car accident. So wow. um, I had PTSD, obviously after that I had PTSD, but I didn't know what the hell PTSD was. You were in the car? No, I wasn't. I was okay. I was in a car behind them. Okay. So I didn't know what PTSD was, or I didn't know like you could get PTSD from that. Like, you know, when I thought about PTSD, I thought about veterans. 
Yeah. Or I didn't know what the symptoms were either. You know, we're just not educated on mental health illnesses and what, what those things look like. It, it's so frowned upon. It's I like, know, it's so sad. But now it's thankfully like people are making it okay to talk about and okay and giving people the, face, the space to feel that. So um, I had PTSD, I didn't know that I had that and then I realized that I did and I was like, all right, if I go to a therapist, they're gonna send me to a psychiatrist and they're gonna give me drugs. I don't wanna take that route. Okay. I don't wanna be on drugs. Um, so I was like, I can get rid of this myself. So I started reading a lot of books. Like, on, Did that like, work? No, it kind of worked. I started reading a lot of like um, self-help books as far as like neuroscience. I was trying to get down to like why is my brain working this way? Okay. What? Jesus. Why? Yeah. <laughs> you really you went down an intense rabbit hole. <laughs> yeah, I did. So uh, and that's when I decided to go back to school for a second time to go study psychology. Okay. So um, and that point in my life obviously was very hectic, or at least it felt like because I was working two jobs, going to school full time, dealing with the PTSD. Um, and at that point in my life, like you can ask like the other bartenders, mm -hmm. waitresses, waiters, and um, DJs that worked with me. On the slow nights that I worked during the week, I would sit at the bar on top of the ice cooler and read my books. So mm -hmm. like for those hours, I would read like, I would get like two books in a week. What, like what kind of symptoms did you have as a result of the PTSD? Anxiety, like severe anxiety, crippling anxiety. So like the only time you got me out of the house was to go do something I needed to do, which was school and work. Wow. Other than that, like you need me to go anywhere else, like I'm not going. How did you end up overcoming that? Therapy. So. Fucking therapy, I love therapy. <laughs> Therapy's awesome. Therapy is, is awesome. awesome, with the right therapist. With the right therapist. I say all the time, you interview your therapist. You don't just go to a therapist and that's the one. You have to interview them. Did you, you ever see my video, Everybody Needs Therapy? No, I didn't, but I'll go watch it. So it was, it was a long time ago. I think before we were, we were Instagram friends. Uh -huh. um, I never like, I never thought therapy was a bad thing. I just always thought therapy was something for people who, who couldn't open up and need, or needed a safe place, mm -hmm. or if you're going for couples counseling just mm -hmm. to get on the same page. But um, I really think everybody needs therapy. Everybody. Like, like, I think you need to go, like, everybody needs to go at least, like, once a month mm -hmm. as, like, a like a kind of checkup thing yeah. with the right therapist. With the right therapist. You the have right, to interview them. The right therapist will, like, change your life. Mm -hmm. The wrong therapist will make you feel like you are out of your mind. Exactly. So, um, when I got to my breaking point where I was like, this is ridiculous. I, like, my symptoms was the severe anxiety, crippling anxiety. I was having, like, four panic attacks a week. Mm. What? Driving, yeah. In my car, I would have panic attacks. So, um... I was like, this is ridiculous. My poor mother dealing with all that. She would be my phone call. I'm like, I'm gonna die and somebody needs to know where I am, mom. <laughs> As a result of the accident. Yes. But that makes sense though. Yeah, so, so it all made sense. But at the time I didn't understand. I was 19, I was 19. Okay. I was dealing for two years from 19 to 21. Okay. I didn't understand what was going on. My mom didn't understand. Like she understood it, but she, she did her best to deal with it. Not deal with it, but like help me go through it. But she didn't know what tools to give me to overcome it. Well, which yeah, understandable. who does, yeah. yeah. So, um, when I got to my breaking point, I'm like, enough is enough. Like, I'm exhausted. I'm, I don't know where I'm going in life. I don't know what I want to do. Uh, I decided to go see therapy. And I've always been very, like, spiritual and on the holistic side of mm. things. So I was like, you know, F the conventional therapist. I'm going to go find myself a holistic therapist. What's the difference? So a holistic therapist, um, they incorporate other forms of therapy versus, like, a conventional therapist would. Like, like you know, the uh, what East Western medicine. Okay. So it's just... I've never, I've tried like two Western medicine therapists and it's just like the talk therapy. Like they kind of just talk to you and they know what to talk about because they're educated in this. Like I'm okay. not putting them down at all, but it wasn't like you said, it's the right therapist. So it wasn't for me. I resonated more with the spiritual side of things and holistic and I knew that one way to treat what I had was through drugs and I was trying to avoid that altogether. So okay. I'm like, I know if I go to you know a regular therapist, they're gonna send me off to a psychiatrist and I'm gonna go down that hole that I don't wanna do. So I, ended up researching for holistic therapists. And funny enough, like the last day job that I had um, before I went and reached out to her, to my therapist, was at this uh, medical building in Garden City. Okay. So I was working there two days a week. I would literally get out of work, um, 6 a.m., go home shower, and then go to work there Thursdays and Fridays. Mm -hmm. So um, very like smooth, easy going job, thankfully. I didn't have to do much, just sit there and just tell people where their doctor's office was. So anyways, I had quit that place and when I reached uh, breaking point, I was Googling holistic therapy. Okay. So I found her and she, funny enough, was in that building in the basement. I okay. was like, why did I never know this? Like this whole time I was working here, I didn't know that. So I reached out to her. Um, so her forms of therapy, it's, it can be anything. They do like muscle testing, hypnosis, not in the okay. typical hypnosis sense, like, you know, go to sleep, yeah. but they get, they access it through different ways. Um, acupuncture, Reiki. Really? Uh, mm -hmm. As a means of therapy? Mm -hmm. 
No shit. Yeah. Okay. So it's just a matter of like, these are all your tools or like your medicines. Okay. Which one is the best fit for you? Okay. So I went to her and I told her what happened. And she's like, and I think that's the first time that I came to terms I had PTSD. For two years, I had PTSD and I was like, I don't have this. I'm, I'm not, I'm fine. That's a really long time to deal with that. Yeah. So um, there's people to deal with it longer. I feel like, or symptoms of any illness, mental illness longer. So I feel like I got out of it early. Um, so I went to her and I told her what's happening. She's like, you have PTSD, you poor thing. I was just like, oh, <laughs> I do. So she's, so she's like, don't worry, you'll be fine. We're gonna get rid of it and you're gonna be fine. I'm like, Are you? she said it with such confidence. She's like, eh, it's not like, as if she was putting a Band-Aid, you know, like, oh, like I scraped my knee or something. She's like, go home and Google the havening technique. That's what we're gonna do to you next time we see each other. Okay. So uh, I went to her following week and I Googled the havening technique. You, I couldn't find, I wanted to read like, and I wanted to watch videos and read hours about it and just dive into it. All I could find was the havening technique is basically when the therapist has you bring up that traumatizing moment. Okay. And at that same time, they're like touching your face, touching your arms, like as if a mom with a baby would when they're crying. When you know, when the mom's when the baby's crying, the mom's going shh, 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 like rubbing the baby to calm it down. Okay. Essentially the same thing. So she's so they're forcing you to think about that tra- traumatic experience at the same time calming you down. Yeah, they're ma- they're doing positive like association mm-hmm. with it. Like, so we went and did it and it's it's that's like the you know like the summary of it. There's a bunch of other things that we did like mental exercises in that hour that we okay. did and um basically it was just to get from point A to to the end of it. She's like pick the pick an image of that day that um, that you see all the time. So she's like, think about it. And it doesn't matter if it's like her, her, the most horrific, whatever, whatever, whatever it was. It she's like, whatever okay. that image was to you that you that every time you think about it, it pops in your head. Think about it. Okay. She'd be like, what is it? How do you feel? Da da da. Ask me all these questions. So I, I was there, obviously, like bawling my eyes out. I feel X, Y, and Z. And then we would do all these different exercises while she was rubbing my face and that, and ha- like having me even she had me doing like um, nursery school songs like. Row, row your boat or twinkle twinkle like hum it she's like all right now we're gonna hum mm-hmm. like different crazy things like that so in it what is it to kind of like i'll say use like reboot your system for lack of a better word so basically when i first met her she explained like uh it's in the amygdala that what was happening right okay that's the part of your brain where your brain like you know protects you or whatever so she's like she's like we're not just, she's like think of it as a weed we're not gonna just go rip the weed out like just take it out cut it she's like no we're gonna go take out the roots we're gonna go cut it out she's so these these are all like i guess brain exercises to get in there and and she's like ultimately that's it's that's memory it's there to serve you okay but every time you think about it you don't every time you think about it or have a trigger your body doesn't have to put yourself as if it's in that type of danger okay so that's what your body was essentially doing so that's what she was trying i guess train my brain to do or have me train my brain to do like this is a memory no it's not happening anymore that's interesting because that's what ptsd is ultimately like um, if you've never suffered from PTSD, it's basically when you have the moment when yeah. you're triggered. It's literally like you're watching a movie of that day. But of you were experience. You weren't in any physical danger Mm-mm. during the accident, right? No, it's just what I saw was just very yeah. horrific, you know. So, um, so and thankfully I wasn't in any danger. I came out of it in one piece, thankfully. But so that's pretty much the gist of it. What she was trying to do, I guess, like this is not happening to you anymore. Like, think, you know say thank you to your amygdala, but you're safe and use it as a memory, that's it. So ultimately the end goal was to Shit. have myself there. Like at the end of it all, okay. she's like, how do you feel now? I'm like, she's like, picture that day. I'm like, I'm literally looking that day like as if it's just like I'm watching TV now. This like, was all done in one session? In one hour. No, mm-hmm. she yep. she cured this entire mm-hmm. thing two years in one hour. Yep. Wow. Yeah. I, was I gonna, tell everybody this. I'm like, go to therapy. <laughs> my follow up question was going to be like, oh, you know, how long did this take? Because I feel like I know a lot of people that are in therapy two days a week for like forever. Mm-hmm. One hour. One hour. Mm-hmm. Done. I, I always tell people holistic therapy, like that. The other two days a week did it. Like, you're just dragging it. It's like you're putting, like, you have a wound and you're just like putting, dropping alcohol on it. Drop by, you know how, or what is it, hydrogen peroxide when it stings? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're doing like drop by drop by drop. Like, it's just you're you're making it painful for no reason. So one hour. One hour done. done. Mm-hmm. I like after that hour is done because those two years I felt like because the normal Laura was very outgoing, hardworking. Like people would ask me like, "How do you get all this shit done?" I'm like, "I don't know. I just do. Mm-hmm. I don't think. I just do." They're like, "But you do so much." I'm like, "I just do it." Mm-hmm. So um, in those two years, that wasn't me. So after that hour was up, I was like, oh, "I'm me again." Like, "Hi, so nice to finally be back in my body." Like I felt normal. Does this lady still practice? Yes. Wow, that's yes. interesting. She's awesome. I love her. So, and I went back to her again last year during real estate because 
you know, what I did in my first year of real estate, I didn't know it was not a normal thing to do. All I just knew was just work, 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 because that's who I am. What do you mean by that? Like, the business that I did in, in nine months, my first year of real estate. Oh, okay. I just knew, like, all I know is, all I know is hard work, you know, and stick to it, be the best you can be at it, and work hard. Would you say you have an addictive personality? Um, I don't think so. I don't know. I'm just curious. I don't just think curious. so. But, um, so, during that time, I was feeling symptoms again, like mm. what I felt before, like the anxiety, the depression, the overwhelmment, all these things. And I'm like, oh shit, like is this is still harping over me. So I went back to her, I'm like, Harriet, I think this this will happen. She's like, no, she's like, you can't get PTSD again unless there's another traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. You're going through other things. So, and I won't get into that session, but that session we went into where those where those symptoms were born essentially in my life like what part of my life that came from mm -hmm. and again in one session we got rid of all those symptoms i, I was like oh lady. great like i can go back to work and feel normal the reason why i asked you do you have an addictive personality is i i have an addictive personality mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons why i don't mess with alcohol or uh -huh. anything like that mm -hmm. but i feel like a lot of like super successful people like for you to do the amount of business you did in such a short period of time you have to be like just consumed by it yeah and I think I think the reason why I don't have addictive personality is because um, you have to just realize when is the time to balance for yourself. Like when is the time to like with alcohol? When is the time to party hard and you know get <laughs> wasted? And when is it? When is the time to just have one drink? Like are you are you able to discipline yourself and have that enough control to distinguish the two? Because there's some people who go out and just drink to get fucked up all the time. Do you do that in your work life though? Yes. So um, last year I worked, 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 worked. The pandemic is what had me put things in perspective and realize like I need to treat my work life the same as I would treat anything else. Like too much of it is not good for you. So um, the pandemic put things in perspective. And last year what I lacked a lot of was like family time and friends. Like I couldn't keep friends. My friends are like, you're too busy, you're always working. I'm like, how, but how does that make me a bad friend? <laughs> I don't know if it makes you a bad friend. Yeah, it's but just, no, that's can... like the way they were talking to me about it. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you don't have enough time for me. You don't want to see me. I'm like, but I'm working. It's not that I'm avoiding you. I'm working. So this year has really put it in perspective to me that I need to, and it's good for me too, to have a social life and just do mm -hmm. things that's not real estate. Um, so how do you balance that in a way that you're still growing your business and you're not like twitching when you're not working? So... Um, you gotta take anxiety out of the mix. I feel like people who, and it's not in a bad way. If this is who you are, that's who you are, God bless. But for me, like if I'm constantly thinking about like the next move and work, 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 and stress, essentially stressing, stressing myself out of it, because it almost gets stressful, right? The anxiety and the stress, like, oh man, I didn't hit my numbers. Oh man, I didn't do this. I need to put out these many, this much content this week, because if I don't, everything's gonna fall apart. Mm -hmm. You gotta give yourself grace. Like it's 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 a journey it's you know it's it's a marathon right so um you have to give yourself grace and give yourself time points for everything my first year in real estate i didn't know what the hell i was doing i was just working 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 this year i'm like all right i know i want to do this forever not well not forever but this is it for me mm -hmm. whatever aspect i go whether it's mortgages real estate investing this is my world now. nice um do i have to do it all within by by 2021 no, do I have to all do it all by 2022? No, it's like I'm 24, I have my whole life ahead of me to do these things, so that's how I think about it. Like, relax, you're gonna get it done, you're gonna sell the houses, you're gonna be that listing agent, you're gonna do the mortgages, you're gonna flip the houses, but it doesn't have to be in the next month or the next year. You never feel like you're like you're behind? Like, no, Not behind. like you're running out of time, but you like you never think to yourself, oh, I feel like I should be further along or this or that. Do you so, ever? Sometimes I feel like that, so, and that's why like I love the people that I'm surrounded with, because I'll go and tell them that and I'll start venting. I'm like, oh, this and the third, da, da, da. and they're like, do you hear yourself? What other 24 year old has this much money coming in, is doing this many deals? And I'm like, oh, you're right. Like they put these things in perspective to me. To, they remind me, because you're, you're, you know, you're your worst critic. You're, mm -hmm. you know, you're tough on yourself. So they put these things in perspective and they're like, oh yeah, that's right. I am doing really good for myself. I am, you know, I am going up right now. Mm -hmm. I'm not going as up as, a, as like instantly. But I am like, if I were to look at my my spreadsheet, my numbers, mm -hmm. everything's going up right now. Like, what am I what am I crying about? What am I worried about? Hey guys, if you haven't already, you have to join my text platform. I'm doing a ton of one-on-one -on -one engagement in there and giving away all my best secrets on fix and flip, rental properties, how to find off-market deals, and how to succeed at the highest level in the real estate business. Shoot me a text. So let's talk about doing deals. 2019, your first year, mm -hmm. nine months. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about what it was like to, you know, to get in to pick a broker and then ultimately what they did for you and then how you just 
basically how'd you do that business? So I got in the I got in the industry altogether, and I think this is the best way for anybody who is aspiring to be in real estate is to find a mentor. Okay, that's like what I would listen on Agreed. to my podcasts and my YouTube videos. They would be like, get a mentor, get a mentor, work for free, okay. all this stuff, right? So I put that out into the universe. I'm like, I need a real estate mentor. I need a heavy hitter. I need a top producer, and I'm gonna be their shadow. That's interesting. And anything that they need me to do, I will go do it. I'm gonna be their shadow and work for free. It makes sense. It's just really hard to find somebody who's like that. Yeah, because so, there's only like a hand. There's really only like like a dozen really, you know, kick-ass mm-hmm. agents that are really generating a ton of business. Yeah, so through bartending, through my brother's bar, um, through my sphere of influence, I would just talk about my dreams. Like, this is what mm. I want to do. I want to be a realtor. And then people would be like, oh, I know somebody. You'd, you know, you'd pair up great with them. So everybody was referring people to me to who mm. to go work with. I ultimately ended up meeting Sal. So Sal was like, I do real estate and mortgages. Okay. And he's also two very similar backgrounds. He was a barber and everything. Like he just knows what it is to work hard and work your way up to something. So um, we ended up clicking like that. And then he's like, try mortgages first. He's like, I think it's essential and it's a truth. I think this too, that all realtors have a sufficient like knowledge on mortgages to hold their weight. They should, they should, but they don't. don't. They don't. No. No. Not at all. No. And I think it's very, like, and whatever. And, like, no, I guess nobody was there to tell them that, but I think I'm telling you now. <laughs> Do it. Like, learn about <laughs> mortgages. So, because it, it helps a lot with the deal. Mm-hmm. Like, a lot of deals right now this year have been falling apart like crazy. How many houses have you seen back on the market? As a result of what? Just, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. There's, there's, there's a bunch of things. I mean, a lot of things factor into it, which is the truth. Like a lot of things factor into it. There's a lot it. of buyer's remorse because people are bidding like crazy and since everything's going over ask, people but, like freak out. But once you're going to contract, that's it. You can't have buyer's remorse in contract. You're talking back on the market in the sense that when houses go back on the market, like they're in contract and then oh, the deal falls okay, apart. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, realtors should be calling lenders, should be calling lenders, should be asking, well, should be asking the right questions too first. Like um when I had a, I had a listing right, I had two listings right when the market, when we opened back up mm-hmm. for real estate. My first question was to to the offers that came in, what does your buyer do for a living? Are they an essential, are they a cop? Are they, you know, what are, are they essential worker? Ultimately just because job security. How yeah. many of our deals fell apart because people lost their jobs? Of course. So, and some of our deals, some of my deals didn't fall apart because they had, they were essential. They kept working, so nothing happened to them. So that was like one of my first questions. To, um, and also two like important things to know, if, if, if it's an FHA approval, like, all right, what's their DTI? And people don't have to tell you these things, but I also don't, like, I also don't have to advise my my seller mm-hmm. to accept this offer. You know, I, I tell my sellers everything that's going on. These are the points. Okay. These are, these are the strong points. These are the cons. So, you know, you don't have to tell me these things, but it helps your case. Yeah. So, like, what's your DTI looking like? Is it tight? You know, if your buyer sneezes, if it's an FHA loan and your buyer sneezes, that's it, you know, they, they don't get the loan. I'm actually really surprised. So obviously all agents aren't created equal. No. Right? Mm-hmm. And um, now that you think about it, now that you mention it, it's interesting that they don't make it mandatory for agents to go through some kind of training with more yeah. so that they can identify and understand. Mm-hmm. But, you know, education is here. Like I've told every single agent probably I've ever met, I'm like, you should go and get an appraiser's license. Mm-hmm. And they're like, why? And I'm like, because just think about it logically. You're trying to, if you have six agents come in, if six, six agents go into one list of property, right? Mm-hmm. And they're all going to say, They'll sell the fastest. They're all going to say that they're the best. They market the best. They do videos, whatever it is, right? How do you how do you distinguish yourself? How many agents do you know that are actually appraisers? I don't know one. Exactly. No, that's a good point. Me, <laughs> I'll be one. No, I'm just kidding. But you have. To, I mean, that's how you distinguish yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's you the truth. Uh huh. But what you're doing is 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 very smart so, because by mm-hmm. going through that and being able to understand it, you uh, you keep a lot of deals from falling apart. And I always say to mortgage people, and this never happens also, is I'm like, if I get an offer from your client, mm-hmm. I want a full call, phone call from you. Mm-hmm. I never hear from any of these people. Yeah. And that's when you start to have problems. Like I had a deal that was going for two and a half months and just fell apart. We had to switch it to another mortgage broker because they just, they didn't run the credit. They didn't do the, mm-hmm. they didn't realize that the person had, you know, $20,000 in mm-hmm. student loans and they had a take the person off and put the father on, especially when you're dealing with the stuff that we deal with, yeah. like FHA and I think, buyers. Yes, and I think having the knowledge like of the mortgage world, what goes on and how you qualify a buyer or what can qualify a buyer and then ultimately break, the, you know, not let them qualify anymore, having that knowledge is good because you'll know what questions to ask when you're going to accept an offer mm-hmm. or taking on a client too. Like, I, like with Zillow, I'll take on a client. I got my mortgage from, or my pre-approval from so-and-so. 
or I'll call the guy. And sometimes if it's, you know, a, a regular bank like Chase or something, they don't have to be licensed. Mm-hmm. So if I'm just getting a kid on the phone who's just, you know, taking orders, I'm asking these questions, he doesn't know how to answer them. And I'm just like, you know, and I'll tell my buyer, I'm like, you're, you know, this is not the, you're not picking the best to serve you right now. You know, not saying that it's that specific bank, but that specific loan officer, you're not picking the best. He's not serving you the, the, in the best way. So, so there's another thing that you brought up before that I want to kind of drill home because mm-hmm. I think people just kind of quickly glance over it is um, when you go out into the world, you tell everybody what you do. Yeah. Like that is so massively important. Like I always preach to people, I'm like, listen, when I meet somebody, I introduce myself, I tell them exactly, I ask them like, you know, what are you doing? What are your goals? What are your dreams? Like all these mm-hmm. kind of like weird questions mm-hmm. and I actually care. And then I think about like, who in my network do I know, assuming I think they're a good person that I can link them mm-hmm. up with to kind of help them better their yeah. life. Uh, and then I tell them what I do and what I'm looking to do and what my goals and dreams are. And hopefully it's it's reciprocated. But mm-hmm. if, if you don't go out there and tell people like what you want to do, mm-hmm. how is that anybody is, to know? Yeah, it's not going yeah, to like, happen. No one's going to know that you're into real estate, that you're into mortgages, that you're selling properties if you don't tell them. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, you have to be proud of what you do. Like That's the way I look at it. I'm so proud of being a realtor. I'm so proud of this that I have all this knowledge and I can do all these things because I love what I do. Like I'm passionate about this. And that's the one thing that people tell me a lot when they hear me talk real estate, like, wow, you're very passionate. I'm like, mm-hmm. yes, I am. This is this is my love. So um, it's very important that everybody knows. And you have to love what you do. I think you can't just talk about it in a, in a business way with people because people are not going to, the way we all talk real estate is mm-hmm. not how anybody else can talk. I can talk real estate with, you know, yeah. somebody else who's not in the business. So I think it just ties into how much you love doing it, the passion. Is it, it's fun for me. Like I got to, I, I love this stuff. No, it's awesome. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. We get to go to work every day. It's always different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the one thing that we touched on before, but I really want to kind of go over more now is um, the thing that, that you and Sal do that is so interesting to me is you don't really do any of the traditional marketing mm-hmm. type of methods, but you guys are doing a ton of business. So, like, you're not networking, you're not like cold calling, you're not like using Zillow leads, like, you're not doing any of that mm-hmm. stuff. But he's like, I never, he's like, I don't leave my house. Like, I leave my house to go eat hibachi and then I come yeah, back. Uh-huh. And I'm like, bro, where are you getting all this business from? He's like, I don't know. So, um, yeah, I've never cold called or knocked mm-hmm. on the door. So, um, Never called expired, never done any no. of that stuff. Not to say I never will. I, mm-hmm. you, know, some, you have to try everything. I just haven't had the opportunity to do it. The reason being is because, thankfully, we're just very bus- busy with a referral business. Mm-hmm. So that's what it comes down to is a referral business. And we've been... But how do you create such a powerful referral business in such a short period of time? That's the very interesting part. So ultimately, when Sal decided which way he was gonna go, whether it was real estate, mortgages, or being a barber. Okay. He chose, <laughs> it was very close between being a barber and mortgages, let me tell you. So um, he, he was almost gonna continue cutting hair. But, um, so he chose mortgages. So I ultimately took all the real estate business, and that came through the door. So I treat. so I, I had that like stamp of approval from him, like, oh, this mm-hmm. she's good, she's good at what she does. And then Got it. ultimately, you know, it, uh, he'll pass someone on to me. They don't have to stay with me. They don't like me if you don't click. Yeah. So it just comes down to that, what type of relationship am I building with my clients? They're my clients now. That's my, you know, I'm going to sell them a house. Yeah. Uh, I want to be their friend. I want to be someone that they can call. They can be comfortable around. Like, ask me that one question a million times. I'm not going to get upset with you because yeah. I'm going to tell you it over and over. Call me at 10 o'clock at night. Send me houses at two in the morning. I might not be up, but I'll see it first thing in the morning. Like, be that comfortable with me. So I always gave my clients that that ground, and I think that's just what it came came down to. After that, like, oh, set, you know, go to Laura, go to Laura, call Laura. You guys are like, I mean, it sounds like you guys are just you're a real team. You guys are similar people in the sense that you're both out there like grinding, mm-hmm. you know, really hustling, and you look out for each other, and you're genuinely trying to even with Josh. Like, so yeah. Josh works with us too. Like Josh, I try. Yeah, it's like the three of you mm-hmm. guys seem to be like this force. Yeah. So Josh works at different brokers than I do. He works at Exit. Um, I gave Exit a try with Josh. It just wasn't for me at the time. Maybe one day Josh and I will combine powers <laughs> and be great together. But at the time, it wasn't for me. Um, so with Josh, to this day, like Josh, we're on two different brokerages. And if I need something or if Josh needs something, I can call Josh. Can you please go to this inspection for me? Or he'll call me. Can you please do this? We have each other's backs, no question about it. So and we don't expect anything out of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just, I don't know. We're, we're friends. That's what friends do. What um, there's a lot of agents that are getting into real estate now uh-huh. because they see, you know, it's it, the it's money. sexy. There's money, like houses in Long Island are flying. Um, 
But again, like we spoke before, I feel like there's not really a lot of education. Like you sign up Mm -mm. with a broker, they're just kind of like, you know, good luck. Yeah. What kind of advice do you give to agents that are first coming in to to basically succeed? Because again, 50% of the agents never do one deal. Yeah. So find a mentor and you know, people have asked to shadow me and all this stuff. Okay, great. You can shadow me. The door's always open. Like, there's an extra seat in my car right next to me. Come shadow me. You need to look for them. You can't, like, I will never call you. Be like, oh, you want to do real estate? Come meet me here today. Like, no. Mm-hmm. You call me. Ask me where I'm going to be that day. I will I will always be doing something. I'll tell you where to meet me. Like, I'm not too busy for you. Like, you want to learn? Come learn. You're not bothering me. But I'm not going to look for you either. And I think that's where a lot of people, especially like in my age group, fail. Okay. They're like, oh, we don't want to bother you, or I don't know, I don't know what the mindset with that is, but they just don't, they're not, they don't, they're not aggressive about it. Yeah. So, um, if you're getting into real estate and you got your license and already get license, first of all, don't don't call a realtor being like, I want to shadow you without even being in school. Go to do a seventy five hour course, get your license, and then you know, do your research too. Who do you want to shadow? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, on social media, there's so many ways to get to know people. Uh, give and give them a reason to to let you shadow them. Like I wouldn't care if somebody shadowed me, but just call me, ask me where I am. Mm-hmm. Like be, text me. I'll always have something for you to do. Uh, that's the best thing to do is just be up, be up somebody's ass. <laughs> mm-hmm. No, you got to really want it. Yeah, I mean it's that mm-hmm. simple. People it's, always come to me like, oh, you know, I want to be a realtor. It looks great. I'm like, yo, you can make a lot of money being a realtor, mm-hmm. but only two percent of the realtors make yeah. all the money. It's as simple. Like I'm trying to make it more complex than what it is. No, it's it's that simple. Be up somebody's ass. Find the right mentor. Find the right fit be up their ass you know if you're only oh i work and i this you have at least one day off you at least have an afternoon a morning off whatever your free time is if you want it that bad you're gonna go get it so whatever that day or free hour is that you have go be present and learn that's the only way you're gonna do it toma toma agale. you know what toma means toma take it all right just want to make sure <laughs> honey we went i got this. you on that one i was hoping maybe i could get you on a second Cru- no, one no you didn't get me on cruise <laughs> Let's not forget. <laughs> what? Uh, so my last question is: You are obviously very young, even though you've done like you've lived like a lifetime in twenty four years. It seems yeah. Like. I say I always say like I'm twenty four going on sixty. Like seriously, like sixty year old with like an old. Are, are you an old like soul? J-Lo. <laughs> so we'll touch on this. I have a lot of respect for J Lo, but I do think that J Lo, from 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 a look standpoint, and she's fifty something years old, she looks amazing. I do think J Lo is a little overrated. People can disagree. It's my opinion. Just putting it out there. It's okay. So, what does what does the future look like? Because I'm trying to put in my I'm picturing myself at 24, and I didn't even know like which way was up and down. Mm-hmm. I um I came from like a very a, a pretty privileged upbringing. I mean, like normal you know middle class. Mm-hmm. I grew up in Wantawa, but um. I look at that kind of like as a handicap in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, like I always say to my parents, I'm like, I really wish that you guys haven't hadn't given me so much mm-hmm. because I feel like not until like you go through real struggle. Like later on, I went through struggle. I'm realized like, oh, okay, and that like lights the fire. Mm-hmm. So I don't know why I went down that route, but the point is, what um, you know, what do the next five, ten, twenty years look like? It's real estate. I'm gonna stay in the real estate world. I'm gonna slow down. As you can see from my life, I've grown up so fast. I did so much. Mm-hmm. I was living life, living life very fast, trying to find myself. I found what it is that I want to do. So I'm going to slow down. This is ultimately what I want to do, real okay. estate. Um, I know for sure I'm going to get my license in mortgages. Okay. I'm very interested in that world. And I think um, being a lender just like allows you more freedom. You can- Okay, in what way? You can work remote. Like I can, like you can be licensed in all 50 states. Oh, as opposed to running. Yeah, uh-huh. so you work, you work from home, you can be licensed in all 50 states. Uh, you can do a lot more in volume, in my opinion, if you just do it right. Um, that's a whole other world too. But there's mm. a lot of loan officers that are, you know, are doing a million a month, and even I think, from what I know in the industry, I think that's like a pretty high number. Um, so you can do in volume like 11, 10, 11 million in, in one month. Yeah, that's a lot of hard work. You have to really know your ship, but people are doing it. Yeah. So the commission off that is way more. Like. Yeah. So and that's that's you being a loan officer with a processor. From I feel like, and I don't know, I'm too new in the business and real estate to say this with confidence, but you can tell me if I'm wrong. For a realtor by mm-hmm. myself to do 11 million in one month, I mean, I'd have to be doing luxury real estate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's... By myself, like... <laughs> the cool thing about real estate is it 
it can be anything you want it to be, yes. right? It can be as small as you want, as big as you mm -hmm. want. I guess it all really comes down to what kind of life do you want to have? live? Uh huh. So that's what I'm saying. Like I'm gonna slow down. Like I really mm -hmm. enjoy spending time with my family, doing stuff with my family, my friends, um, non real estate related things on my yeah. off time. And this is why I got into it, to have the freedom. So why am I getting into this to have the freedom and then be like work, 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 nonstop, what's the next best thing? Like that's not what I want. So, and that's just gonna, you know, go backwards for me if I have that mindset because I see everybody else having that mindset. Like I remember uh, last year I met with this broker. Okay. And he asked me the same question. What do you want, where do you see yourself in the next five years? I really didn't know last year where I saw myself in the next five years. And, um, he and then whatever we had that meeting and then like I think I went somewhere on vacation or I did something on a Saturday that wasn't real estate related and he DM'd me he's like wow like you're a realtor and you're not working I was like what like as if to look down on you yeah I was like um yeah like I, I'm a person first <laughs> yeah. so and I feel like a lot of people have that mindset which is fine that's the mindset you want to have like that's who I who you ident identify as great like but so um, I kind of got I kind of got rid of that feeling like oh people are looking down on me if I'm not doing all this business and I suck <laughs> I'm a loser so I kind of got over it so now I'm like slowing down real estate's what I want to do because it's, it's a very big industry um, next year <laughs> I don't I was I didn't want to mention it but I'll say it next year I definitely want to get into flipping oh yeah yeah I want to get into flipping oh, houses yeah. I think it's so cool like that world of it like that's why I love watching your stuff because you're just constantly flipping I'm like this is what I want I want to do one flip next year like all by myself like a big girl <laughs> nice good for you yeah you need the education first yes so um definitely like my sister-in-law she's she comes from a background of like um contractor she's an architect so like i'm always constantly picking her brain about that i listen to your stuff so definitely that's the goal next year like this year was just selling real estate getting more listings i got more listings this year than i did last year next year is just uh that is getting my mortgage license you should you should repeat the same thing which is get you should join uh ria Ria, uh, East Coast Ria, Real Estate Investment Association, R E I A. Okay. Right. So back to your like, you you have the blueprint for success. You already used it, mm -hmm. right? So mentor. So there's a gentleman that that's where I started. Mm -hmm. So I um I went to NYU back when the crash happened. I took a, a one day course on foreclosures because mm -hmm. when you first get into the flipping, you think, oh, like the banks are just giving houses away, which is obviously not the case. Mm -hmm. So they said, join the local RIA. So I joined East Coast RIA and I met my mentor, Carl Chavone, who runs it. And I trained with him for four years before I ever did a deal. And, but with that foundation, that's Set it. Like the, the sky mm -hmm. is the limit. So that's like, that's an awesome organization that you should mm -hmm. check out. They meet once a month, you go there, it's like 35 bucks, you have dinner and they have speakers and it's, and it's awesome. And that's really like, I raised a lot of money there. I made a lot of friends there. I met a con ton of contacts for construction, mm -hmm. XYZ. But, um, you should do it. Yeah, definitely will. The awesome thing about you, and I think the theme of the podcast, it's like a dual theme. A, you got to break your ass. Yeah, I mean, we got to work hard. Hustle is that's it. Mm -hmm. Second, you um, you experience a lot of different things. Like you're never afraid to try something, mm -hmm. and through the process of constantly trying different things, you find yourself doors open. Some things don't work out, but it's always like this uh, progressive movement of you yeah. just. You know, nothing, propelling your life. Yeah, forward. you're never um you no, know, nothing's a fail. Like you're never really losing. You only lose or fail when you like give up. Mm -hmm. You're like, Oh, that's it, I'm done. But um if you if you fail a couple of times or if you, you know, fail, you don't do something the way you want it to happen or don't do your numbers for the year, like you're just it's a learning experience. What am I all right, this this didn't go right. How can I like regroup? What can I do right this time? Who can I go call? A mentor or somebody who's gonna give me the answers uh, or guide me and show me not what to do wrong. Very smart. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate you coming down. Thank you. Very cool. Um, if people are interested in possibly working with you or they need a house sold, any investors out there, how do people find you? How do they get in touch with you? So you can call me, 516-304-6400. That's my cell phone number. <laughs> <laughs> That's my real number. That's my real number, yes. You can follow me on Instagram on my business page, which is Guijen, G-U-I-L-L-E-N, period L for Laura. Okay, got it, <laughs> makes sense. So that's just what I always had. Um, I never, that's another side note, I never decided to be Laura the realtor or whatever, I'm just, I am me. <laughs> what so if, I never took on a name. It's working? Yeah. Don't don't mess with it. So, um, or if you just wanna follow me in my personal life, I have my personal Instagram too. 
It's Laura Guijan with two, or Laura period Guijan with two ends at the end. That's pretty much it. Message me on either one of those and I'll be there. And obviously, if you have a house that smells like cat pee, is dated from the 1960s, land, commercial property, anything real estate related, hopefully we'll get to do a deal together yes. someday. I want to buy it. I'm the handsome home buyer. 516-777 sold. And obviously, if you have any kind of permit issues and I expect your business in the future, yes. you got to call the captain. 516-513-8838. That's a wrap. 